Welcome to the Tarantula Collective. My name is Richard, and if you enjoy species-specific care and husbandry videos like this, then make sure you hit that like button. And don't forget to subscribe and turn on all notifications so you're alerted every time I upload a new video. Now, this week we'll be discussing a species that people have been requesting for months. Now, I have both a juvenile and an adult female in my collection, and I've been putting off filming this video mainly because she's such a defensive tarantula, and they're fossorial, so it's kind of hard to get them out of their enclosure and filmed. But hopefully we'll get enough footage of this will make an enjoyable video for you all, and you might learn something. Seriopagopus levitis, formerly known as the Haplopelma levidium, and commonly known as the cobalt blue tarantula, was described by Smith in 1996. This tarantula is an old world fossorial species indigenous to the rainforests of Vietnam, Laos, Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand, Cambodia, and Myanmar. Though people rarely find them due to the loss of its natural habitat. At first glance, this tarantula appears to be black. However, upon closer inspection and under the right lighting, the true bright blue color becomes very apparent, making this a unique, one of a kind, gorgeous teeth. Like most Asian species of tarantula, the cobalt blue can be a very defensive tea. It is important to note the difference between aggressive and defensive, as aggressive suggests the tarantula will attempt to attack unprovoked. This tarantula is described as defensive because it only reacts to perceived threats to its safety, usually giving an impressive threat pose and slapping the ground when you disturb its enclosure. This tarantula has been known to bite when they feel in danger and can quickly escalate from threat pose to attempting to bite. So heed their warnings and back off and give them space when necessary. Despite their bad attitude, this is a gorgeous species with an amazing blue coloration, which is why it's so popular amongst hobbyists. The downside of this species is that even though it's gorgeous, it spends the majority of its time deep in its burrow, usually only allowing you to see the front half of it that it will hang out the front of its burrow. This species grows to about a 5 inch leg span and lives about 15 to 18 years, with males only living about 5 or 6 years. This species does exhibit some sexual dimorphism, as the males are light tan or bronze in color and much leggier when they mature. Additionally, males gain palpable balls on the pedipalps and tibial hooks. The female eventually becomes larger than the males as well. Due to the fact that they live in the rainforests of Southeast Asia, they do require a higher level of humidity in their enclosures. That coupled with their strong defensive behavior puts them at the expert level for tarantula keepers. Now I keep my spiderlings in my basic fossorial spiderling enclosure with more depth than width. I fill the enclosure up about two thirds with substrate and make sure there is enough room between the top of the enclosure and the top of the substrate for the tea to web up its entrance. I keep the substrate damp and provide a water dish if there is room. If I can't fit a water dish into the enclosure, I just strip water on the webbing. When they outgrow this enclosure, I rehouse the juvenile tarantula into an acrylic fossorial juvie enclosure with more depth than width. Again, I keep the enclosure filled up about two thirds with substrate that I also keep damp. I provide a water dish and make a starter burrow on the side of the enclosure to help it get started with its burrowing. My juvenile cobalt blue tends to make elaborate tunnels out of their burrow and across the floor of the enclosure. So putting in little pieces of cork bark or fake plants for them to use as anchor points for their webs may be helpful. Once they outgrow their juvenile enclosure, I've moved this tarantula into an adult enclosure at least five gallons in size. You want a minimum of three times the leg span of the tarantula in width and give this tea plenty of substrate so it can make its deep burrows. I keep the bottom layer of the substrate damp by pouring water down the corners of the enclosure to saturate the bottom layers of dirt. I am careful not to pour too much too quickly and flood their burrows, and I don't saturate it to the point of being swampy. If you don't give them enough room to burrow, they will web up the floor of their enclosure heavily and make web tunnels, essentially turning their enclosure into their burrow. This may look cool, but can be very problematic. When this happens, your tarantula has nowhere to retreat to when they feel threatened. So when you open the lid of the enclosure to feed her water, it is as if you ripped off the roof of their home and are invading their burrow. This can lead to the tarantula being very defensive immediately and even feeling so threatened that they slap, charge, or even try to bolt out of the enclosure. 
This species is extremely quick, especially as adults, and has medically significant venom. A bite from this tea will be very painful and can cause nausea, muscle cramps, joint aches, and other serious issues. So be careful and give them the best husbandry possible. If they have a safe route of retreat, they will typically dive into their burrow and hide before getting defensive. As far as feeding, I start off my smallest spiderlings with confused flower beetles or pre-killed small crickets or roaches, as they will scavenge feed at this size. I feed them once or twice a week and remove any uneaten prey within 24 hours and wait at least two or three days after a molt before attempting to feed. For juveniles, I feed one or two small crickets every seven to 10 days, depending on the size of their abdomen. I wait at least seven days after a molt before feeding this tea again and always check on them 24 hours after feeding to remove any uneaten prey. If I suspect the tarantula is in pre-molt, I remove uneaten prey immediately and try to feed seven days later. And as adults, I drop in a large adult dubia or five or six large crickets every three or four weeks, again, depending on the size of the tarantula's abdomen. If it's really plump, I'll cut back on frequency and amount. Because of the moisture requirements for this species and the damp substrate in the enclosure, it is very important to remove any uneaten or dead prey or prey parts as soon as possible to avoid any issues with mold and mites. Spot clean the enclosure regularly to remove any boluses, molts, or any organic matter that could become a food source for mites. Having absolutely no mites in a tropical style enclosure is next to impossible and not all mites are harmful. But if there is an explosion in the population of the mites, you can add springtails to the enclosure as they will compete with the mites for the food source and always win, eradicating them from the enclosure. This is a great species to consider for a bioactive enclosure, and it's on the top of my list for my next bioactive rehouse. The main issue to consider is that since this is a fossorial tea, they will burrow down to the bottom and will quickly destroy any drainage layer that you make on the bottom of a bioactive setup. There are bioactive packages and setups available online that do not use a drainage layer. And that is the route I'm planning on trying when I set mine up with our new enclosure. This tarantula is one of the most popular teas in the hobby because of its striking colors and infamous defensive nature. I do not recommend this as a beginner or even an intermediate species and suggest it only for keepers comfortable keeping old world teas that can be fast and have attitude. When kept properly and proper respect is shown when interacting during feeding and rehousing, there are very few, if any, issues. But if you attempt to provoke the tarantula or are negligent in your care and husbandry or while rehousing, this tea can pose some danger. So always use best practices when rehousing, unpacking, and feeding your tarantula. Be mindful and deliberate in your movements and you will have no problems from these beautiful teas. Of all the tarantulas in my collection, this tea has me in awe over its appearance and attitude whenever I see it out of its burrow. And other than a few threat poses when rehousing, my cobalt blue has never shown any other real defensive behaviors and never charged or slapped the ground at me, let alone attempted to bite. I thoroughly enjoy this species and highly recommend it to anyone ready to take on this type of tarantula. It was a very intense experience filming this tarantula as I was pretty scared uh, pretty much the whole time. But as you can see, she behaved herself fairly well and had no real issues. This tarantula is one of the most beautiful ones in my collection and I wish only that it spent more time out in the open. But I find if you don't overfeed them all the time, they will spend a lot more time at the mouth of their burrow. Almost every time I come downstairs, mine's like halfway out the front of its burrow. And usually will stay there unless I disturb it some way, walk too close or touch its enclosure, then it will dive back and hide. Now when I had my spiderling, I pretty much never saw it. Maybe every now and then it would come up to the mouth of its burrow and grab a cricket I was dangling. But other than that, it stayed hidden in the bottom of its enclosure pretty much the entire time. Very similar to the juvenile though, occasionally I would see it come out and wander its enclosure, maybe get it drink of water from the dish. And I would never suggest trying to handle this tarantula, just due to its speed and defensive nature. Now, after you've been keeping a few old world tarantulas for a little while and you've become accustomed to their speed, then possibly consider adding one of these to your collection. It's not just the speed and defensive nature that is challenging with this species. It's the fact that you need to keep their enclosure kind of damp 
They need that little bit of humidity and you need to be able to maintain that without having issues with mold and mites and all the stuff that comes with a more humid enclosure. But I've got a few different videos on my channel about setting up bioactive enclosures and I plan on adding a few more in the near future. So feel free to check those out if you need a few pointers or ideas. Now I got this shirt as a gift from ArachnoTube. I've got them listed under my suggested channels on my YouTube page and I'll leave a link to his channel down below in the description. So be sure you check out Gar's channel. If you enjoyed this video or found it helpful, make sure you hit that like button. It really helps out. And if you want to see more content like this in the future, go ahead and subscribe and hit that notification bell. And don't forget to select all notifications so you'll be alerted every time I upload new content. Right now, I'm uploading new videos every Tuesday and every Thursday. But occasionally, I may drop an extra video sometime throughout the week. So if you don't want to miss out, make sure you're subscribed. For more content in between videos, you can always follow me on TikTok or on Instagram. And make sure you join the Facebook group if you got any questions or just want to join in some tarantula discussion. Links for everything that I use here in the Tarantula Collective as far as like setups for the teas to the cameras and stuff that I use for filming. You can find all of that information as well as other podcasts, YouTube channels, Channels, care sheets, merchandise, anything tarantula related on my website, thetarantulacollective.com. Well, thanks again for joining me. I appreciate all your all support. Channel's growing like wildfire and it's blowing my mind. So hopefully I'll see you this Thursday for the third upload in the Thursday series. But if not, I will see you next Tuesday. <laughs>